Okay, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to look at the first four verses of James this morning. And uh, the title of the message is, Why Me? Why Now? Now, we typically work through a book or an extended passage of Scripture, but for the time being, uh, I've decided to go to go-to passages, right, uh, that speak directly to what we're dealing with. I mean, let's face it, what we're dealing with is really once-in-a-century type stuff. The quarantines, uh, the, perfect, the protective measures. I mean, I, my, my queso that I love has not been in Walmart the entire time during this quarantine. That is a crisis. No toilet paper, although I will say, I don't know about anybody else, but I, this week I noticed that there is starting to be more toilet paper in the aisles, and I was wondering if that might be something like, like Noah's Ark. When the first bird brings back a leaf and there's a remnant and okay, so maybe this is letting up. And so going into the store this week, you see some, some bits of toilet paper. Maybe, maybe just maybe this is letting up. It's the first sign that we're climbing out. But, but seriously, anybody that tells you they know what the world is going to look like in six months, they're bluffing. There are intelligent people who have intelligent guesses and probabilities that we should consider, and we ought to consider folks that, that, that have specialties in that area, we ought to consider what they say, but nobody knows for sure. This is black swan type, type stuff, which if you're not familiar with that term, it's the improbable event that catches us off guard and has lasting consequences. We're in a black swan type event right now. And so what we need is, is comfort. What we need is insight from the scriptures. We need that to help us navigate because, I mean, who, who, who's even lived through something like this before? So we're, we're kind of like, well, how are we doing this? What are we going to do? And we need the Bible to help us navigate. And uh, I've been purposely kind of steering us to passages that don't shy away from hard times and hard topics because that's what we're in right now been steering us towards passages that guide us with what to do in the middle of great difficulty and passages that bring us hope in the middle of that difficulty. Like last week on Easter, Jesus' great words there, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will return. And so all of that is why we're in James chapter 1. And we're in James 1 and we're trying to, we're attempting to answer the question, well, why me? Why now? And, and so before we do that, let me give you a little bit of an intro to James. The fact, as you begin to read in verse 1 there, the fact that the writer, whoever he is, just gives his first name with no other descriptions, it could be considered a mark of humility, but I think also it's quite possible that it tells us that he was a well-known figure in the first century church. So the other James we're really familiar with, James the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 apostles, he died as a martyr before this writing. So what other James could there be that's well known that could write his name like this James, a servant of God, and expect everybody else to know who it is? That's how we understand that this is almost certainly James, the Lord's brother, one of the half-brothers of Jesus. You see, contrary to what some teach Mary was not a perpetual virgin. She had children with Joseph after Jesus' birth. And while Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father, Joseph did have biological children with Mary. And James is one of those children. Now you could imagine then, right, what it would be like to grow up with Jesus as a sibling, to grow up with him as a brother, especially if like sin reigned in the moment. You can't blame Jesus for anything. Who didn't finish their job? Well, Jesus didn't finish it. It was him. Who didn't put their stuff away? Well, that was Jesus. And of course, that's not the case. He always finishes his job. He always puts his stuff away. Hide and seek is no fun because, man, it's like you always know where I'm at. How's that working? It's like you have eyes everywhere. So James, uh, for whatever reason, sadly didn't believe that Jesus was Savior. He didn't believe in him as Messiah during all of Jesus' life. In fact, John chapter 7, verse 5 tells us this, not even his brothers, speaking of Jesus, not even his biological or not his, bi his half-brothers, not even they believed in him. That's really one of those underappreciated 
difficulties of Jesus' life and ministry. His own family rejected his message. His own brothers didn't believe in him. But all of that changes at the cross and after the resurrection because James ultimately does believe. He becomes a leader in the early church. He is known as James the Just or James the Righteous. In reading this letter from James, you can see that, that, that pastoral flavor. He was this early church leader, and it kind of is apparent as you read the entire letter. And we're not going to read the entire letter or go through all of it. But he gives us like these great pastoral word pictures and illustrations like good pastors do of fire and ships and horses. He refers to his readers in endearing terms. There's also, as the letter begins, there's no great literary introduction as some of the other letters and, and books are started in that way. He doesn't waste words. He just gets right down to it. And by verse 2 of chapter 1, James jumps right into the deep end of answering and tackling tough questions. There are some similarities, I, I think, and others have noted this, with James to, to Proverbs. Uh, it's not wisdom literature, but the way James writes, you can see some similarities to Proverbs. It's that kind of style. Sometimes there's not an obvious progression of thought. Rather, James is not afraid to move from one topic to the next topic. And sometimes when he does that, he does it abruptly. I, I liken it to uh, our boy Ryan Ogletree. All right, and if you know Ryan, one of the things you need to do to know Ryan Ogletree better is you need to eat with him at his favorite restaurant, which is in Grapevine. It's called Asian Top Buffet. And Ryan at, at Asian Top, that's what he does. He just jumps around from spot to spot, right? Like, um, Kung Pao chicken, yes! And then speaking of Kung Pao chicken, chocolate pudding. And, you know, like, what do those things have to do with each other? But it makes sense in Ryan's mind. And so that's, what, that's how you understand what James is doing. James writes like Ryan eats at Asian Top, okay? That's what James does. And so, so as, with that as a brief intro, and now we're all hungry and we're all... Maybe looking forward to going to Asian Top one of these days. We're going to have Briley Taylor read James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So follow along in your Bibles at home. Take it away, Briley. Hi, I'm here to read James 1, 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and Lord <clears throat> Jesus Christ, and 12 tribes scattered among the nations, Consider it pure, my brothers, whenever you face trials of my kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not liking anything. Thank you. All right, so that was Briley Taylor. Thank you, Briley. Did everybody catch what she read? James 1, verse 1, James, all right, just first name only, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. All we get is his name. He's known. He's understood. It. People know who he is. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. And that is it for pleasantries. That is it for an introduction. Verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He jumps right in. He's writing to people, to an audience, specifically suffering from the dispersion because of persecution. And he writes them and says, count it all joy when you suffer this persecution. The first thing to notice about James is that James is unashamedly a Christ follower now. Whatever he was while Jesus was alive and not believing and not on the, not on the boat, like not, not with him, I mean, what James want people to know about him is not his, not his nickname, like his, on the street, I'm James the Just or James, James the Righteous, not trying to brag, but that's who I am. He doesn't want to be known by that. I am James, and who am I? I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no mention of his relation to Jesus, no reference to himself as James the Just or leader of the church of Jerusalem, which he was. No, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and I love his straightforward nature. Greetings. Now, enough of the small talk. Let's go on. 
So let's talk turkey, right? As one of my high school teachers used to say. Verse 2, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Most New Testament writers begin with blessings and thanksgiving. And, and, and they take several verses to get into their letter, but not James. James gets right to preaching. There's that pastoral flavor. And he begins by addressing hardship. And it suggests that hardship and persecution were a major reason for his writing the, the, the letter that he does. It's as if James knows the question on his reader's heart. God, why me? Why now? And see, right there, the Bible is addressing our fears. A book that was written or a letter that was written 2,000 years ago, it's immediately relevant. It's immediately addressing our fears. Who here hasn't asked that question? Why me? Why now? Especially in the last few weeks. Maybe a new business venture you're pursuing, and then this hits. Why me? And why now? Maybe you're looking to sell your house. Well, why, why me? Why us? Why now? You're a high school senior looking forward to graduation with honors. Why me? Why now? So what does the Bible have to say about hardship? What does the Bible have to say about difficulty, about suffering? And while we're asking questions, does God allow those things? Like how do you describe God's role in that? Does he simply allow it or does he ordain it? And if he ordains it, if he ordains suffering, why would a good God ordain hardship? Why would a good God ordain suffering? Why allow your own people to suffer? It's certainly one of the most difficult questions to ask. And we won't cover all that the Bible has to say today on trials and suffering and God's motivation. James won't answer all of our questions on it today. But pastorally, he attacks the hardest question first. Pastor, why me? Why now? And here's the first thing we see from James' James's writing. The first thing he says is that trials are inevitable. When you meet trials of various kinds. The letter is addressed to Christians. It's for Christians. Brothers here is to be understood as the general phrase we would use, brothers and sisters. Everybody understood this was a general greeting. And James, as he begins, he doesn't hedge. He doesn't say, like, if you meet trials, if you're living a really good life and all of a sudden hardship happens or suffering comes upon you, he doesn't use the word if, right? When you meet trials of various kind, there is no if, it's when. And you need to understand, and I need to understand, that this is a common theme of Scripture. And what it does is it preps the Christian for hardship. But, you know, we don't really listen well to that. And when it comes, when hardship comes, we're kind of like, where did this come from? What, what's the deal here? You know, last week we did a Lonesome Dove drive-by and visited some of, some of our folks. And, and I was leading this, like, 25-car uh, group. And we passed right by a sign in Grapevine near the lake that said, Stop, turn around, there's water on the road. And I saw the, I saw the sign, and there are 25 cars behind me. But I just figured that the, the water was probably off. The sign didn't apply to me. And wouldn't you know, when we get there, there's water all over the road, like, like four feet of water. Where did that come from? The sign was telling you, turn around. And so what the Bible does first when it comes to hardship and suffering, and we're not listening, is like, when it comes. Not if it comes. Not like it might come. Or an 8% probability. When hardship comes in your Christian walk, James writes with a certainty. Trials are inevitable. And this is really, really important. Because there's an entire industry of false teachers. They preach what's called a, a prosperity gospel. It's led by teachers who smile well, who prey on the hurts and the hopes of many people. They promise you your best life if you believe enough. They promise you really good things if your faith is strong enough. They're fools who blow into cameras and claim to defeat coronavirus. They're charlatans, they're frauds, and they will answer to God. They claim it's all about your thinking. 
And it's all about unlocking specific prayers that grant you a higher level. And if you give them enough money and you believe enough, you'll be able to bypass hardship. And that's just not the case in the Bible. Brothers, when you meet trials, not if, when, isn't the only place we could spend the whole time looking at other verses. Here's just a couple examples. John chapter 16. In this world, you will have tribulation. There's Jesus speaking. Acts chapter 14. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Find me one prominent figure in Scripture who didn't suffer hardship, who didn't face difficulty, right? Who didn't, you know, struggle. You can't. Trials are inevitable. And while at first glance that seems depressing, in pastoral counseling, what I found is that this understanding brings people relief. Because when they are met with very difficult circumstances, is there something wrong with me, Jason? Did, did, does God just hate me? Is he just picking on me? Did I do something to make him hate me? Is my faith just not strong enough? Like some of these preachers say, like, I'm trying to believe that all these good things will come and visualize the house on the hill, and, and, and it just hasn't happened. Is it wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Is it, am I not praying the right words? And, and the answer is no. Often, the answer is you did nothing to deserve it. Quite the contrary, because of the sin-cursed world we live in, because we battle against principalities and powers, and yes, even sometimes because of our own poor choices or the choices of others that are beyond our control, choices like, hey, I wonder what bat tastes like. Why don't we try that out? What could go wrong with that? Right? that those are all different types of reasons why we face hardship. You can expect hardship. You can expect testing. When, not if. Trials are inevitable. Here's the second thing. Second thing, second thing James wants us to know is that trials will come in many forms. Look what, he, look what he says there. When you meet trials, when not if, when you meet trials of various kinds. What does he, what does he mean by trials of various kinds? Alistair Begg says it this way, and I like this. He's describing both trials we meet, in other words, that that come upon us through, all, through no fault of our own and trials we make. In other words, the messes that are our own doing. Both of those types of hardship should be understand when James says, count it all joy, when you meet trials of various kinds. Some of those hardships are unexpected. They are completely beyond our control. It's simply the result of living in a fallen world we suffer because of the choices of others. We suffer because of there are principalities at work that want to bring hardship. We suffer because of the sinful actions of others. In the King James, they use the phrase fall into. It's also used in the parable of the Good Samaritan where the man fell among robbers. It wasn't his fault. This came upon him. This was a trial that, that he met, right? He bore no fault in that. So we can expect unexpected trials, trials that we meet, trials that we weren't looking for, we didn't ask for, we had nothing to do with them coming upon us, and yet they're here through no fault of our own. God doesn't hate you. He warns us and he preps us that these things are coming. There are also, of course, trials that we make. It's somewhat ironic to ask God, why me? Right? Why now, after a, a lung cancer diagnosis, when you've been a smoker your entire adult life? Okay, why me? Because you've been smoking your entire adult life. I mean, God still walks with us through that hardship, but that's all on us. Or why me? Right? With a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes when the people at Krispy Kreme know you on a first name basis, right? Of course. Right, that goes back to that saying that, that we've talked about before. Everything happens for a reason, and sometimes the reason is you're dumb and you make stupid decisions. And that's the case for all of us. So some of these trials are trials we meet, we fall into, had nothing to do with us. Some of those hardships are things we bring on ourselves. Some of the trials and the testing we face will be the direct result of our own foolish choices or the foolish, sinful actions of others. And one of God's great mercies on us is that he often 
lessens the earthly consequences. And he uses those consequences of our decisions or the decisions of others for our good. And he uses it to correct us and grow us and strengthen us. You know, the Apostle Paul, just one example, had what is described as a thorn in the flesh in Scripture. Three times he pleads with God, remove it, lift it. I could be such an, a better apostle if this thorn was removed. And he said it was given to him to keep him from being conceited. You can expect in life trials that you meet, unexpected trials. You can expect trials that you make that God will use to, to correct us. Some trials are really just common to your stage of life. It's why it's so important to be in a community, in a church community, with believers of all walks of life in all ages. When you're in it, those, those, those believers of different ages and different backgrounds and listening to their stories, man, it helps. Because you're in it right now and you feel like this is never going to end. You feel as if you're the only one. And then you hear from your brother or sister in Christ and hear about how God brought them through something similarly. And then that, that encourages your faith. And they pray with you. And they lift you up. And you feel like, okay, they've been through this and God delivered them. We need fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to walk with us. We need a community of believers. Such a difficult time to be separated like we are. Looking forward to when we can all be, be get together again. But we need that community to testify how God has walked us through our own hardships. Ones that just met us and ones we made of ourselves. To testify that as big as that hardship seemed in the moment. That in the rear view now. It seems small. To testify of God's deliverance. I mean, every single stage of your life has its own joy and trouble, right? Every single stage. I look at all the, the babies in church and the little ones in the nursery, and man, I'll tell you what, just keep them coming. And I hope that more will come out of this quarantine, okay? Like, that's what I hope, all right? But it's been a long time since Ginger and I have had children in diapers. And sometimes I think to myself when I see these little cute kids toddling around or crawling around, man, it would be great to have kids again at that age because it was a wonderful time. Those were good days. And of course, I'm remembering the good times. You know what else I like, though? I like my sleep. I like to be able to go to bed and not get woken up in the middle of the night. You know, I like not having to wipe baby bottoms and not having to deal with diaper blowouts. Every single stage of life brings its joy, and every single stage of life brings its trouble, fun, and heartache, trials of various kinds, trials of singleness. I can't wait to be married. That's a stage of life. Will I be married? Of course, those are questions. Trials of marriage. Now you are married, but man, you know what? It'd kind of be nice to be single for a weekend so I could watch like Rambo Last Blood on, on Netflix, you know? Like I could watch what I want to watch. Um, I don't think that, but I've heard other people think that, okay? Uh, trials of childlessness. Trials of parenting. Every stage of life brings joy and hardship. Being a Christian doesn't release you from that. Not here, not till we get to heaven. Not only does it not release you, the Bible says expect it. It will come in many forms, various kinds, all kinds of trials. But the day is coming. And that's why we look to the heavens with expectations and we ask, how long, O Lord? The day is coming when all of those things will be lifted. First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Think about the types, the kinds of suffering mentioned there, mental, spiritual, physical. All of them included in Paul's description of God's testing in his life. Trials of all types are inevitable. Okay, but why? Is God a sadist? Does he enjoy this? Does he just enjoy unleashing suffering and, and watching it happen? Why would you allow Christians to suffer? Why ordain that suffering? And it's funny you should ask, because like a pastor, James anticipates that question. Okay, but then why does God do that? And that's his third thing he points out here, the third thing I want to point out this morning in this text. Because trials produce perseverance. Trials produce perseverance. The testing of your faith produces 
steadfastness. Listen, one of the purpose, one of the purposes of God testing you, and by the way, you know the difference between testing and temptation, right? God tests Satan tempts, and maybe we'll talk about this more at a later date. God tests. The purpose of testing is for you to pass, for you to succeed in the struggle. The purpose of temptation is for you to stumble and fall. So God tests, right, enabling you, giving the great, giving you the grace to succeed, right, through the struggle. Satan tempts, hoping you will be destroyed. One of the purposes for testing, which is why God ordains it, is it strengthens our faith. Trials produce perseverance. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. One pastor says it this way, faith is a muscle. And when that faith muscle is used, it grows. When it's left alone because I don't really need God, I'm really good on my own and I've really provided everything for myself, that muscle atrophies. So why would God bring testing. One of the reasons, not all the reasons, one of the reasons is it produces perseverance. So Christian, you can know that God has a purpose in that testing. It isn't aimless. He has ordained it so that you may grow in your faith, that you may learn to persevere in Jesus' name. Nothing worth having comes easy. I think I pointed this out a while back. I mean, The last time I had six-pack abs, I leaned up against a chain-link fence, and I had them for like 20 minutes, and that was awesome. It'd be great to have them, but you know how hard it is to have those? It would be great if you could get six-pack abs by sitting on the couch and eating Bluebell, but it doesn't work that way, and life doesn't work that way. God, why me? God, why now? One of a thousand reasons or answers to that question is growth. God is growing you. He is growing you. He is growing your faith. He is producing in you an endurance, a perseverance. He is teaching you to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's why. Think about this in the context of relationships. Our culture, especially our, our, our pop culture, uh, prizes young love and new love as if that is the ultimate expression of of love. But I tell you what, give me a marriage that has lasted and tested and withstood many storms. Give me that marriage any day. When you're young and in love, you know, and the whole like, you complete me and young people in love, there's there's a benefit to that attitude. We can learn from it. It should encourage us, right? Love the enthusiasm, the excitement, but it's also naive. I have had in marriage counseling years ago, people say, I just don't even understand how he could he ever even anger me, right? And I just tried to sit there and not just laugh them out of the room, you know? And even your breath, your bad breath smells like lilies. Like nothing could ever be wrong. And it's just like, give it a few weeks, Let me know how you handle the sound of your spouse slurping coffee in the morning, right? Let me know how you handle the sound of your spouse eating some, uh, you know, cinnamon crunch French toast in the morning when it's really quiet. Let me just know how that goes. I appreciate young love. We can learn from it, and, and, uh, and, and, and it can be a blessing, but we prize it too much as if, like, that's the strongest love or the epitome of love. Give me the love that's withstood in marriage childlessness, the love that's endured the disappointment of a failure in a career, the love that's endured the full effects of the stomach flu or a crippling disease or the love that is, has seen a partner for life and walked them all the way to the grave. Give me that love every time. Youthful love that settles into conviction. Youthful love that's now forged in the fire of adversity and will see marriage through. God, why me? Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The song that I, I still remember as a kid, it was this great reminder. He's still working on me, right? Making me what I ought to be, right? That, he's still working on me. Why me? Why now? Because trials produce perseverance. That isn't the only reason, but that's one reason, and that's what James gives us here. Look at this last thing, and we're done. Finally, James says, and he says it at the beginning, but we'll deal with it at, 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 the, at the end. Embrace trials with joy. Count it all joy. 
What a radical statement by James. He's writing to people in some instances who've lost everything. He himself is going to die a martyr's death for Christ. And he is saying all of it. Count all of it for joy. The Christian can count it all joy because God is sovereign. And whether it's a trial that we meet or it's a trial that we make, God is ordaining it. He's controlling it. He's limiting it so it's not too severe. He's seeing that it's turned for our good. He's seeing that none of it is wasted. The Christian can count it all joy because God is growing us. He's producing in us perseverance. He's molding us into the image of Christ. The early church understood this. Somewhere along the line in our prosperity and in our freedom, we've lost that. So our prayers consist mostly of ways to keep it exactly the same. Keep us safe, keep us peaceful, bring us back safe. There's that, that one great Christian line that everybody always uses, like hedge of protection, right? Like, like uh, that. And that's what our prayers consist of. Our prayers don't consist of grow me, stretch me, produce in me courage or boldness. That's what it was like for the early church. In Acts chapter 4, a really fascinating chapter, Peter and John are threatened with death for testifying of Jesus. And their prayer in part says, Lord, would you consider their threats? Like, hey, Lord, they're threatening us. They're going to kill us. And would you look at that? But more so, they pray for boldness. And maybe that's one of a thousand things that God is doing through this virus, is he's bringing us back in line with the early church, with people knew what it meant and what it took to spread the word, to spread the gospel. If I know that no trial is wasted, if I know that every single hardship is under God's sovereign control, I can pray for deliverance, absolutely, and you should. But I can also pray for courage and boldness and endurance and make that the theme of my prayers. Who here wants God to use them? Of course, everybody does. We all, we all want God to use us. Okay, but understand, if God's going to use you, he's going to train you. He's going to put you through boot camp. That's how soldiers are made. He's prepping you to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why me? Why now? God knows what he's doing. Maybe you'll get that answer quickly. Maybe you'll understand later. Maybe it won't be till heaven. But I can expect trials, and I can embrace them with joy, knowing that God is producing perseverance in me. We finish with that last verse of amazing grace. What's that last verse of amazing grace? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe this far, and his grace will lead me home. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we confess, Lord, uh, that we struggle with why. We struggle with why it comes at all and the timing of it. Lord, we are a people with weak faith. And so we ask for grace, Lord, to trust you. We ask for grace to lean into the difficulty. Lord, we also ask, Lord, that even right now in our time that you would, Lord, by your grace, lessen the impact of this virus. Lord, Lord, change it. We ask you. We can't declare anything. Lord, you're God. We're not. We're asking that you would lessen it, Lord, if it's your will, that it would pass by. Lord, we know you're sovereign over all of it. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to be men and women of faith who endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ and induce doing so with great joy. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name.